and today on our podcast, Let's Talk, Hazel and Betty Ford brings you a story of hope. The story of Willie Burton, college basketball phenom, all-star in the National Basketball Association, a man who knows firsthand the bright spotlight of athletic success, the dark shadow of substance use. Willie, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, it's hard to believe that we're sitting less than a mile from where you really carved out an extraordinary college career at the University of Minnesota. When you look back on those times, what do you think about? I think about sports having the ability to keep me in a safe space Hmm. Um, with all the things that were going on inside me, which I had no idea about, Mm -hmm. Uh, and my um, anxiety um, and some of the ways in which I felt and I thought and I processed information based on my experiences before the age of 10. Before the age of 10. When did you know, and we're going to come back to that in a minute, when did you know you were a good athlete? Well, I didn't know I was a good athlete actually until I started playing with kids my own age. Uh, I grew up around my cousins who were all older and I was the youngest so pretty much they just smashed me at everything. (laughs) So then when I started playing with kids my age I started thinking hey maybe I could compete here you know. So I would say about the age of 10. Okay and then between 10 and 18 you became better and better at basketball, but you also play baseball. Yeah, play baseball, also play football, hmm. uh, and ran track. So, um, you know, my mother decided the smartest thing she could do was to take me and put me into athletics so I wouldn't get into anything. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> and so you came to the University of Minnesota. What year was that? I came to the University of Minnesota in 1987, 86, 87 school year, but it was the calendar year, 1987. Not far from where we are today, as we remarked. And you had a heck of a college career. Yes, I had a great college career from the perspective of watching the television, but (laughs) it wasn't necessarily easy all the way. It wasn't perfect. Uh, I needed coaches. I needed my teammates. I needed all the support I could to keep Willie from self-destructing. So talk more about that. When did you get a sense in college that you had problems behind or off the court? I knew I had problems off the court before I came. And this is one of the things that I, I talk about and yeah. why I wanted to I want to continue to focus on the K-12 population. Mm-hmm. Because when the, you don't know it or you don't realize it, but you have issues before you come to this college campus. And what's happening is those coaches, those academic advisors, and those administrators are left to try to salvage what they can in you and what whatever you went through when you came. Mm-hmm. And I really believe they're... <laughs> There's a great deal of students that come to college campus with issues. Huh. Including you. Did you start to use substances because of things you knew were not right with you, or did you use them because you enjoyed them? I started using them because it, it, it actually was a numbing effect when I tried them. Uh-huh. And being in Detroit, I mean, that stress and pressure, you could die any minute. In you could Detroit. die at any second yeah. in Detroit. I mean, literally, that that anxiety of not knowing who's going to go where. You you you're reading about, watching, and listening about someone dying mm-hmm. almost every day. Um, as a kid, it's not unusual to go to school and walk past brains. Yeah, on the street. So mm-hmm. that promotes anxiety, stress, survival, and then when you take the substances. When I took the substances. I didn't worry about that anymore. I've, and, and be honest with you, you start going to the thing, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. That helped. It's almost like medication for someone. Yes, sure. Yeah. But you had a successful college career, so much so that they retired number 34. Um, it hangs up in the rafters at the barn. So you, you had a great career. How did you square that great college career with the fact that you were struggling with substances and struggling with mental health issues? How did that work? Well, while I'm doing my PhD at the university, I'm reading articles on sports and how sports mask mental health il- issues because physical activity is a barrier and buffer to keep some of those post-traumatic stress and some of those other uh, feelings um, suppressed. Uh-huh. That's one of the things I'm looking at. And I had that hypothesis, and little did I know right now, they're, they're building more and more upon more research. Now, though that didn't, I mean, I still would, would drink. People know I would drink, and they would, you know. So, you know, 
I had a lot of <laughs> shave guards around me. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. he coach would monitor my drinking more than everyone else's. Really? Yeah. He knew. He knew exactly how much I drank and exactly where I was in this city. You believe it or not, as big as this city is, he knew exactly where I was at all times. He would tell me, like, yeah. how you know I was there? Yeah. Yeah. But still, still, you drank, you used substances, you had a successful career, mm -hmm. and then you got drafted top 10 in the NBA in 1990, yes? Correct. Went on to the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. and, and then all my safeguards are out of the way in a pocket full of money. Yeah, man. And then what happened? And then just like you can project, it's, it's a wild free running ride with everyone telling you, hey, it's okay. I don't have Connell or Melvin, a coach, or mm. the individuals around here, or some of my friends here in the, in the Twin Cities to kind of keep me, you know, let's do this, let's do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You're in a place now where everyone wants to be successful, everyone wants to be known, and everyone wants to ride your coattail. Yeah. So your best interest is not their concern. You still had a successful career. You, for a long time, you held the record for the most points scored in a, in a game. That's been blown away this past year, of course. But, mm -hmm. but you had a successful career. When did the problem become more of a problem and your success became less of a success? When was that? It was my first year. Huh. It was my first year. I went to the doctor and I kept complaining of stomach pains and come to find out I was drinking too much. And you were young. I was young. How can a person at the age of 21, 22 be diagnosed with a doctor, by a doctor, at drinking too much? Did you listen to him? Yeah, I listened. You know what I did? Start dabbling in drugs. Uh -huh. In the NBA? In the NBA. Were you worried about getting caught? Uh, yeah. But I was doing different things. I mean, I was trying any and everything. Well, I couldn't drink anymore because my body was going bad at the age of 22. But I can't just live with who I am and myself. I wasn't okay in my own skin. Yeah, man. So you had to medicate. I had to find something to be okay with who I was. Especially now that a lot of my safeguards and a lot of my conscience was being re was removed from me. So, um, it was, it was a rough ride and I did the best I could. I made the best decisions and choices I thought I could make at that age with the information that I had. And the money in your pocket. Do you look back on your career in the NBA? You had a good career. It wasn't as long as others. Do you think your substance use and perhaps your mental health challenges affected the longevity of your career, or were you pretty much done by the late 80s? No, not or at all. the late 90s. I yeah. literally was about to sign another contract here in Minnesota. I had an opportunity to go back to San Antonio because I put that stuff behind me. Okay. So my career, an injury. Oh. An injury. An injury. I, my career, I wanted to come back here and retire as a Timberwolf. Yeah. That was my original goal. I came here. I had a place in Minnetonka. Mm. I was, I was, my life was, had changed. I was sober. Okay. And everything was fine. So, but my life changed in sobriety, not because of. Um, Interesting. Because of, but at the same time, it was more of a blessing to what I'm doing now. Yes. See, if my career doesn't end, and I go on, would I be the person that I am today? Right. Mm. Would I be the father that I am today? or would sports continue to drive and control my decisions? Or would I have the freedom and flexibility to do what I've done? Work with 750,000 kids, <laughs> be a substitute teacher in my kids' class in each one of their classes, a part of their lives, mm -hmm. watch them grow, be attentive in what they're doing, help my community grow and inspire. Which one would I take, <laughs> you know? And I'm still here in Minnesota. So. Go figure. <laughs> so this is a story of hope, and I want to come back to what you we were talking about, but what was that moment when you decided that you needed to get help, that what you needed was partly inside of you, but that you needed professional help? When was that, and how did that happen, Willie? Well, a phone call um, to John Lucas was made. Oh, yeah. On my behalf, actually, and it was the best thing for me. And John had, Lucas, of course, was an NBA player who, was, who struggles with substances, was well-known, and he turned his life around. Correct. So yes. being guided by him, and that was, that was more or less one of the introductions 
for me at that stage with issues and problems that I'm having because I didn't know a way out. I didn't know how to get out. I had no no plan, no exit, no, mm. no, I couldn't see anything except I know I didn't plan on being in this spot. <laughs> I didn't plan on being in this pain. I didn't plan on being in this, this confusion. Uh, I don't know how I got here, <laughs> but you know, the best thing about it was I realized now that that was my training. That was the training I was supposed to go through to help change the lives of others. You turned the adversity of your own struggle into the opportunity to help others. Correct. So let's talk more about that. How much of your own story do you share? How much of your struggles with substances, your time in the NBA, um, all those things, how, how relevant are they to who you are today? They're very relevant, very relevant. I don't hide it at all. Here's the problem, and this is what I've run into. And um, I think with the Pro Football Hall of Fame, they've opened the door for me to do that. Um, you're opening the door for me to tell my story and talk about what has happened for me. Um, I don't think that, you know, even though the programs that have, the programs that I went through were through the NBA and the Players Association, I don't think they, this is just my thought, and they can, you know, do it. I don't think they use the, the, the experience and the, and the things that I've been through and what I'm doing enough. I agree. To, to number one, talk, and talk to community, mm -hmm. but in case players are running into issues, to talk to them. But now they don't have to. It's their business. But I know this much, and this much I do know. Players are going to listen to other players. Mm -hmm. Because until John Lucas came to me, until Dirk Menefield, who now works for the NBA, um, and, and Cliff, Cliff, came to me, other players, I wasn't, I didn't believe and I didn't trust. That came from Detroit. Yeah, not to believe and not to trust. Not to believe and not to trust. But, yeah. I mean, you know, it, 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 but, you know, the platform, I'm not, I don't think I'm give, given a platform in which to do that, right. in which to give this information out that I have for specifically for recovery. Yes. So yes. Um, I would like to have it, but I don't want to force it either. I don't want to, I want it to be, I want it to be welcome and, 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 um, and appreciate it in a genuine, honest, from my soul, oh. not from a script, not, right, you right. know, where right. I'm, I'm being forced or I'm singing a banner that's not <laughs> reality. Cause you know, when you suffering, you know, with addictions and things of that nature, you can, you can catch BS real quick. Oh yeah. You can spot it real quick. Is it genuine or is it real? And I'm not, I wouldn't do it to be anything other than giving back my experience, strength and hope, which was given to me. Amen. So on that note, you pursuing your PhD in sports exercise and psychology, what's your dream? My dream is to continue to work with policymakers and rewrite policy not just on a state level, but a national level, on specific aspects of K-12 and student athletes. I feel that they're an underserviced population. Mm -hmm. It's unfair for me, as far as I, I see it, and this is not a, a gripe, but it's more or less the old NCAA model with the K-12 population. Here's why. You get paid for students to go to school, right? but then you turn around and make money on them at the door for their performance. However, there's no programs or supporting mechanisms for that population to help them understand roles, responsibilities, and what's expected in the high visibility, which is dangerous. Yeah. Secondly, a second factor is that we talked about the hypothesis that physical activity and sports mask mental health issues. So now you have a population in, in there that may have issues that we need to find out what's going on with them before they blow up, before they go off, before they take substances. Yes, yes. So we've only got a couple minutes left. I want to talk about two things. Tell us about XLU, E-X-C-E-L-U. XLU is a curriculum of about, it's a total of 10 different programs for student and student athletes that I developed along the way, um, measured by the University of Minnesota. Um, um. We're supported um, by, you know, the National Basketball Players Association, the Legends of Basketball, mm -hmm. and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So w the goal is next, we're going to train former athletes, uh, hopefully with the Legends of Basketball and across sports, 
to have the ability to go in and make impact because I'm really passionate about going in, finding those Willie Burtons and those, you know, females and the male version of those before we touch that substance to get the information to us so we can understand what we're going through mm -hmm. so we don't cross that bridge. Yes. And arming former students, student athletes, um, mm -hmm. the ability to do that in their particular communities. And I want to also arm collegiate athletes. I want to arm collegiate athletes, especially those seniors that are leaving, those high visibility seniors that may be going back home or in the college town that they're working for because they're credible messengers mm -hmm. to go in and deliver. Mm -hmm. And I really think this is what my purpose was. Yes, yes, and you are a credible messenger. What is um, your message of hope? What does recovery mean to you, Willie? Hmm. Recovery means to me a new way of living, a new way of learning. Mm -hmm. Information and tools that I have that I put on my side and I walk every day as I engage in society. Society is not gonna change. The only thing to change was me. I needed to change. And drugs and alcohol was but a symptom of my disease, but a symptom. I had character defects and other aspects that I need and needed to work on. So that's what recovery is for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Living life on life's terms. Living life on life's terms and being able to give back to others what you've been given. Yes. Yes. Last question, they're going to be uh, athletes, student athletes watching this podcast. Um, they're going to be people of many colors watching this podcast. Mm -hmm. Many of them motivated because they know your story and they themselves are struggling. What is your message to people who are watching or listening to this podcast and who are struggling with substances and are scared? What's your message to them, Willie? I'm one of the few people to score more than 50 points in an NBA game and I couldn't do this alone. I have my jerseys hanging up down the street. At the University of Minnesota, I couldn't do it alone. I was an All-American in high school. I couldn't do it alone. I could score on any basketball player in the world, and there was nothing that they could do about it. But when I walked off the court, I could not do this alone. Don't try to do it alone. Get help. I know it's hard to ask for help, but you ask for help with your jump shot or the way you swim or the way you tackle or the way you did your work or you ask help when you learn how to pick the substance up or learn how to drink or what's the proper way of mixing a drink. Have that same courage if you could about asking for help. Well, we're glad that you um, haven't kept your recovery to yourself, that you have shared it openly with us today and that you're giving it back across this country. Willie Burton, thank you for sharing your message of hope, your story of hope with us today. Thank you for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Remember, there is help out there. All you need to do is ask for it. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Let's Talk. We'll see you again.